the speaker. So I, I had a gentleman lined out uh, and he canceled on me. I sent Sue an email and said, uh, I need a speaker. She said, well, I'll work on it. And it wasn't 20 minutes, she got back with me. Uh, his name's Rick Mansfield. And if you come forward, uh, I'll give him the mic and he can tell you all about himself. Can you hear me without this? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> Tonight, I'm Mr. Charles Ellinghouse. And for those of you who think, well, he didn't wear suspenders that often. Well, sadly, I've been eating too much barbecue lately, and the belts weren't quite done yet. So, yeah. Hopefully, we'll be back in just a regular belt before long, but that's forgive the suspenders. Uh, Ellinghouse inks in her blood maybe. If you cut us, maybe it'd run black. I'm not sure. And that might sound kind of bad, uh, but I mean that in a good way. As a family, as an individual, strongly believe in the words of Thomas Jefferson that as a, for the freedom of this nation to prevail, if he had to give up either a strong army or a free press, he'd forfeit the army and keep the free press. And so it's been an honor to be part of that. And I have a son following in my footsteps that will exceed, I'm sure, far whatever I can accomplish in this life. But what I want to do is take us back to 1922. And this covers some because as an editor, and I was privileged to edit the Greenville Sun, as an editor, one of the biggest challenges, okay, what makes the pages? We just got so much ink. Even though I, I, I was, much like a brother, quick to remind foes that, hey, we buy ink by the barrels. Be careful about, you know, Slenderness. Uh, but still, you just got so many pages. So what makes the pages? What doesn't make the page? So I'm just going to go over some of the highlights. We'll start in January of uh, 1922. Whether these things 100 years from now will be important is hard to say. Uh, speaking of 100 years, though, January edition, one of the articles that did make the cut was we just received our blue book from the state. And it's the 100th blue book. State of Missouri, 100 years. The Blue Book, if you're familiar, that's got everybody, it's all the elected officials statewide and all that, and it just over the years became known as the Blue Book because it's always been bound in blue. And uh, 100 years. So that's something as a Missouri citizen quite proud of. Uh, works, works being done, uh, it commenced finally on the Otter Creek Bridge. Uh, the local lodge is installing some members and uh, volunteers just bought a fine farm bought it off the McLean family. Uh, other timely things were a case of smallpox reported to Hiram. And we do hit on some larger events uh, looking not only for Wayne County but outside. Uh, the, we're in the second year of this grand experiment. And according to chemists who have analyzed a large quantity of so-called liquor seized by the federal prohibition Authorities. Synthetic whiskey is far more dangerous than wood alcohol. And because it contains acetone, which basically eats the lining from your stomach, uh, it contains, uh, and I'm an editor, not a chemist, it contains isopropyl alcohol, which paralyzes the nerve centers. And in this grand experiment so far, we're seeing more deaths, more crime. But just year two, we'll see. On a national scale, we just lost uh, G.B. Selden. And he was the maker of and had the first patent for the practical automobile. And uh, some history books have told us that that actually occurred in Europe, 1886 uh, with Benz. But no, he actually applied for his permit in 1878. He built a 400 pound internal combustion engine automobile. And so he passed away. Everybody recognized his patent, by the way, with the <laughs> exception of Mr. Ford. Uh, Mr. Ford refused to admit that he had patented. Mr. Ford refused to pay for the use of the patent. He went to court 
And much like Mr. Edison, that in their office buildings along with engineers, you find a plethora of lawyers, he prevailed eventually. So Ford never paid into that patent, but he's still recognized. We move into February. Headstones being made available for war heroes, free of charge. And our representative, who always serves us well, Mr. Rhodes, so you can uh, contact his office for the application and for the work to do that. In uh, memory of the Great War, the World War has been called, it's called the Great War. Let's hope it stays there. Let's hope there's never a need to actually number it. Time will tell. Uh, we're getting ready for the Missouri Constitutional Convention, and sadly, the, uh, the turnout for the election of delegates is quite light. And as not so much an editor, but just as a patriot, that was a little bit disappointing. Uh, had two wolves killed near Williamsville. The timber wolves are still alive and well here in the Ozarks. Harding just got through redoing his cabinet, and uh, going back to that war, not that far behind us, uh, we just appointed, uh, Harding did a Secretary of War from Massachusetts, Mr. Weeks, and we still, like many European nations, we have a Secretary of War. Uh, lumber yards being built in Greenville, and this coming Friday, you can once again take the teacher examination. And at our local Greenville m and company, their ad, and we appreciate all our advertisers, uh, corn planters are $70, during hay rakes 40 new mowing machines 70 disc cultivator 60 and a walking cultivator can be had for only $36. And, <laughs> yeah. Pretty good prices. Good prices, yes. That's why we encourage people to shop in Greenville. <laughs> <laughs> Get into March and they've approved a, a bonus for ex-soldiers that's going to be paid out in May. <coughs> We've had another declamatory contest in which our Greenville students fared quite well. And uh, I would hope, as, uh, as much as I'm fond of the printed word, that we always in our schools and our homes emphasize, model, and reinforce good oratory skills, good logical thinking skills. So it does my heart good to report on those kind of things. Uh, on, a, on a world scale, and we try to put some of what's going on around us, because it affects us sooner or later, the four, point, four Power Pacific Treaty has just been ratified by the Senate. And that, of course, is Great Britain, the United States, uh, France, and Japan. Uh, there was some few little hiccups, I'm told by some of our, our correspondents from Washington, that there was fear that there were being secret agreements being worked out between Japan and the United States. But finally, all four parties came to a consensus. Here in April, we sentenced two brothers to life in prison for a hyenas crime. They, uh, the Osborne family, they uh, raided the farm. Uh, not sure whether they killed the husband first or not. One can only kind of maybe pray that they did because Bud Osborne was found tied to a bed with barbed wire in the house that they then set ablaze. Uh, his wife was found in a field unconscious, came to just long enough to identify her two assailants who have now been sentenced to life in prison. Uh, she battles for 20 days in the hospital and finally passed. We, uh, you know, most of us are churchgoers. We see what we've talked about in the Old Testament. We still got that same kind of sin, greed, and avarice here today even in, in places like Wayne County. A child died from strychnine poisoning, just sadly, accidentally, had been kept in the home. Where the child had been told not to drink it. Uh, I hope my boy Harold pays better attention, but it's been my sad experience with young people. If you want them to do something, just say don't. <laughs> and so when left by himself, he tried tasting it and uh, he's gone. Neighboring Fredericktown lost a newspaper plant. That always bothers me uh, when I see that. And forts and tractors are on sale once again for only $395. Now, those of you, of course, that's the tractor built by Ford. And for those of you not familiar with that entire story, uh, there were some enterprising young people that a few years ago thought 
You know, he's building this car. <clears throat> it's just a matter of time till they put that to agricultural use. So they went and they got the name Ford Tractor. And they actually built a few Ford Tractors, not many. But they thought when Mr. Ford and son branch off into tractors, they will obviously have to buy us out. <coughs> Henry fooled them. Hence the Ford car, Fordson tractor. <laughs> Down the road, he probably will buy that name when that company goes broke because they can't begin to compete with his many factories. But the tractor is the Fordson tractor. And like I say, you can have a new one for only $395. Now, like all good community members, I would think, and I won't say leading citizen, but active citizens, we're involved with politics, and I hope that politics never has a dirty name, because I see that as an American citizen, as, as a Missouri citizen, as, as opportunity and obligation. Uh, not, uh, not a bad thing, like anything, it can have bad characteristics, it can have bad characters. but politics, and now we see even prohibition, make strange bedfellows. There recently was a lot of clamor at the White House and a lot of oratory and a lot of letters from diverse groups all against this new noble experiment, the Volkstead ad and prohibition. And so it's kind of interesting to see letters from the Anti-Drinking League right beside letters from the Bush family from St. Louis. But the concern is that, of course, the anti-prohibition wanted done away with. Mr. Bush's letters are actually saying, if you're not gonna do away with it, at least enforce it, because the issue that has brought these letters and brought this tumult to kind of a head right now, and, and no worthy for the paper, is that it's not enforced. And keep in mind, it was never outlawed to drink. It just, you couldn't manufacture, you couldn't sell. Somehow, if it appeared in your house, you could drink it. But it can be sold on cruise ships, including cruise ships not only governed, but in some cases owned by the United States of America. You can't walk into a bar legally and buy liquor. You can walk onto a cruise ship right in our ports and buy liquor. Now, that bothers the anti-drinkers because they're drinking liquor. That bothers Mr. Bush because they're drinking English and German beer not Midwest there. So that's kind of, I found that kind of interesting and a little bit, a little bit hilarious. Uh, our president has set coal prices and he has set them the lowest. Uh, they've ranged from $2.20 a ton to three fifty dollars a ton. Uh, the Appalachian Mountains are where some of the lowest prices are and, and ironically, supposedly some of the best coal. Those of you who had the privilege to visit Eastern Kentucky, you will never see maybe harder working people, you'll never maybe see more beautiful land except here in the Ozarks, and you'll maybe never see poorer people. June, see we're halfway through the year, almost. More moonshine has been recovered. And again, not just what I've seen as an editor and a citizen here, but what I'm seeing in other papers and what I'm hearing from people across the the nation is theft has gone up related to alcohol consumption. Deaths have gone up greatly related to alcohol consumption. And alcohol consumption and the people going to jail has gone up greatly because now the manufacturer of it, this time they confiscated the mash, said they destroyed it. I'm hoping it went somewhere to at least fatten hogs. They, uh, they, just, they confiscated they said and disposed of a great deal of the copper screws. That's a lot of copper tubing, so I'm guessing that was surely reused somewhere, I would hope. They said that no, and I like this, no discernible amount of liquor was confiscated. So I don't know if there just wasn't much there, or by the time the various deputies taste tested, there wasn't a discernible amount left, I don't know. In the very next week, uh, we look at hydrophobia, and this is 1922, but we still have so many misunderstandings about hydrophobia that 
this is an article in our paper, but it was reprinted in others as well, that people still think that you catch hydrophobia from drinking the wrong water. They actually think you catch it during stages of the year and during since it's so often linked to canines that you catch it during our dog days. And sadly, we have people who don't even remember why we call late July and early August dog days. It's because of a constellation. It's one of the constellations the most visible and it does peaks in the, in the skylight in the morning and it's very visible till late, mid to late August. Hence it became known in that constellation as dog and so dog days. But people think that's when you catch rabies. Scientific as of June 1922, you catch rabies by, bitten, by being bitten by an animal that has rabies. And the best, the best attempts to address that are still to take a sharp, clean instrument immediately and deepen the wound and bleed profusely. There are words, I'm just the editor. I hate to edit scientific comment, not having a degree in chemistry, nor biology, nor medicine. Bleed profusely. I would think somebody need to have a handle on that, maybe. And then, the, the, if that doesn't work, the Pasteur method. Now, the Pasteur method, they're leaving out something as an editor, and we look for omissions. We look at where can we cut things, or where things sometimes a reporter hasn't got to us that we really need to make the story. So just reading this on surface, the obvious omission to me was bleeding profusely, you go to the Pasteur method of 12 to 15 shots, what they're skipping is, well, if you don't let the pr bleeding profusely get out of hand, you do not need to administer 12 to 15 shots to a corpse. Yeah, if they bleed profusely too long, you have to. These are the things I enjoyed, it might explain the suspenders instead of the belt, Silva, Saturday, this coming Saturday night, June 24th, an ice cream supper. These people up there know how to make great ice cream. And always liking to pitch in and help where I can. I know how to eat good ice cream. Brings us now to July. Another captured still, this time recoverable amounts of alcohol in quart jars. Now, I don't know if that's my reporters. I don't know if that's his story. I don't know if the police report itself because I don't get to look at every primary source. Uh, but it doesn't say how much recoverable. It just says recoverable quantities in quart jars. Again, with copper tubing. And again, with mash that was subsequently destroyed. And Lodi, Lodi I apologize, a youth was declared insane and transported by the sheriff's local sheriff's department, the sheriff himself, in fact, in this case, to a facility at Farmington Hospital, which maybe many of us are familiar with through friends, acquaintances. I like to say that the reason I know about it is for professional reasons. But what I found kind of ironic in that is it, certainly sad. He's a young man of just 19 years old. He had been teaching for two years. Now, frequently in our paper, we announce a teacher exam coming up. And right now in the state of Missouri, you pass the teacher exam, you're a teacher. So I don't know what his qualifications and everything were up to the taking that test and, and passing. And I don't know whether there was some predisposition or my own personal thinking is two years of teaching a lot of the kids I've met, yeah, you need a little break in farming. <laughs> but for whatever reason, that young man, and, and we certainly, he's in our prayers, and the sheriff himself said he hopes that the treatment up there works and in, in this very upcoming school year, he can be once more with the children. <laughs> Someday they might think we have a teacher shortage. I think if we're hoping to get people out of the mental institution back in classrooms, maybe we have a bit of a teacher shortage now, I'm not sure. Mid-July, we have more wolves, and this time a dog killed by a wolf, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, well, Benjamin didn't try to perfect my, but Mr. Dees heard a dog treed, and it is a custom much in rural Wayne County. He grabbed his 22 single shot and he went out to dispatch the squirrel that probably had a tree. On the way to the tree, the dog went from barking tree to howling and then silence. As he got closer, he just heard growling. He got there in time to see two timber wolves consuming what was left of the squirrel dog. He shot and killed one, a large female, having to reload a single shot, the other one escaped into the woods. Uh, 
I do think that right now, Greenville and Wayne County, we are quite civilized, but this is just a good reminder that uh, wilderness is close. And I enjoy that myself. I enjoy the civilized part, but I enjoy that I don't have to read Daniel Boone's journeys as much as I've enjoyed reading such things. I don't have to read school crafts. I don't have to, you know, I can just put on a good pair of hiking shoes and I'm in the wilderness, not that far. Railroad shopman's strike is still on. A new washer has been purchased by the Barrett Mines. And a Chato, Chautauqua program was well received. And for those of you that haven't attended one of them yet, the name comes from Chautauqua, New York, of which I've never had the pleasure yet of visiting. But they started putting these together as entertainment back in the 18, late 1800s. Here we are in 1922, and it, it does my heart good to see that they're still traveling. It's basically a traveling tent show. Instead of the circus animals or trick shooters or things like that, you have oratory. This time they had five singing ladies on a Sunday. They had a pottery maker that did demonstrations from the stage, and they just have a lot of skills that are performed. And most of these Chautauqua clubs, in this case, there are only 20 signed up members, so they're paying six and a half dollars a year at this point. <laughs> Hopefully they increase that membership and then their each individual fee will decrease. But then they have to, to talk with shows that are both not only entertaining, but very educational. And they have them frequently. And if you've never attended one, I, I've, I've been privileged. And again, I can write it off as part of my job. I mean, you know, if I look up and say I'm going fishing, you know, maybe sometimes people, you know, Charles, should you work harder? If I go to a talk with meeting, I have my notepad, it's, it's business. But they're very entertaining, they're very enlightening, and uh, just a few years ago, our own Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt said that they were the most American form of entertainment he knew of, and uh, I took that as high praise. Campfire Girls, we see, we're having a sale soon, and they're having it on a Saturday. They'll have many uh, homemade, delicious items, a lot of casseroles, along with baked goods. So basically, you can go by there Saturday and buy everything you need for your Sunday dinner. Not that that affects most of us men, because again, much like the ice cream suppers, I always feel my role at the Sunday dinner is to eat. But for those women that have to prepare it, maybe some more of us men should be quicker to go buy a lot of these and make that a gift to our wife Saturday evening. Here, honey, it's tomorrow's. <laughs> it's a thought. If it comes down to a you know, paper subscription or that, you know, please make sure you renew your paper subscription. But if you got a little leftover, Please do. We're in August now, and these kind of events saddened me. A boy drowned in the Black River Friday. It wasn't a flash flood. He wasn't hurt. Ironically, he's 16 years old, a strapping young man by all accounts, was standing on a board out over the river uh, near a barge, and he was warned by his friends, careful you don't fall. And as he turned to say, I'm all right, he fell into the river. Few of them dove, didn't find him. What I find sad, of course, is the death of a young man in his prime, 16 years of age. But the number of people we have around with this, uh, this myriad of beautiful spring-fed streams in this country that do not know how to swim. And someday, just ask those in your family, ask those around you. And the way this is, the way I've seen this replicated is, is, is when I do ask, well, you know, well, what happens is, and I'm not sure in this case, but what happens in many cases, somebody in a family drowns. And so the caretakers, mothers, grandmothers, sometimes older sisters, they warn their siblings, their brothers, and, and themselves, don't go near the water because uncle so-and-so drowned. And so they never go near the water, so they never learn to swim. And, and having sadly reported in place these in news, you know, in the type, because much of my job is the typesetting and, and such. When you look at all the facts, and sometimes we don't, we, as I've said earlier, we just got so much column space, but it's not a flash flood. Sometimes they're coming back from visiting a neighbor or just a creek crossing that's two foot deep. A wagon hits a rock and jars a kid off into two feet of water. He washes down into six or seven foot of water and drowns. Because he can't swim and none of his family can swim the same. 
I don't have an answer for you right now, other than it's not that hard to learn to dog paddle. That's basically the extent of my swimming ability, but I can dog paddle in 10 or 100 foot of water. And, and like I said, when you read these on the surface, you, you think, well, wonder what went wrong. But frequently what went wrong is just, in this case, it was very, it was actually an eddy to the river and it was pretty still water. He just did not know how to swim. We have another teacher's examination scheduled for Friday and Saturday. But I love, and they wrote this, I just put it in here, but I love this. Please be on hand early the first day so we can finish and get to the Farm Bureau barbecue Saturday. <laughs> and then over here, plans completed for the big barbecue Saturday. So, and you do have to pass the test. There's no shortcuts. But rather than take too long, have to come back Saturday or heaven forbid show up Saturday to take it. It's Friday and Saturday, but they're requesting come Friday, get there early Friday, get done with it Friday, so they can go, we can all go to the barbecue. Uh, pension granted to Civil War widow. Yes, it's 1922. I haven't jumped back in, even though her paper's been around far longer than that. She was married in 1864. Her husband died in 1865. She was a young lady. She naturally got remarried later and then that gentleman passed she then married a man of the cloth later and he passed and so being left without much of a living at all she sought the her soldier's pension pension from her husband the civil war veteran who died in battle and again i'm very proud that our, our representative Rhodes helped and a lawyer that took the case found a special interest because he her first husband on which she was filing passed in battle sir as a union soldier serving with the father of this lawyer that took the case that the father had talked about the heroism of this man and so once he intervened what had been a almost decade-long pursuit was brought to fruition and finally she received like eighteen hundred dollars and is going to receive sixty dollars a month for the rest of her life so and I think that's what's neat about living in 1922 was that we're still, it was a horrific event. And when we talk about war veterans, of course, we just got done with that world war, some calling the Great War, meaning it's immensity, not that it was good. Uh, but many of us have relatives and friends that are still directly linked to the Civil War. And a lot of us grew up visiting with Maybe they're past now, but as young children, we visited and sat on the knee of men that lived through that, or women that lived through that, because it was horrific. Wars like that that we came through, I can't say won, but that we came through, wars like the Revolutionary that we did win, we talk about men so often, but none of them would ever been fought and certainly never survived and, and won without strong wives and sisters, mothers and daughters. So, like that lady getting the pension, it's good to always remember the great cause that they've given as well. We had uh, postal laws violated by the Ku Klux Klan. And sometimes in my editing you will see uh, a bit of my very strong feelings. But I find it a little funny that people that go about warning people to do what's right need to hide their actions behind sheets. And I say so. And in this case, threatening people for not obeying the law and the very act of them mailing that threat in a United States postal letter, they violated a federal statute. I don't know that they, their grand wizard would catch the irony, but I did. This next study, and it wasn't done in our county, but it's applicable but captured my interest greatly. This is in September. And rattlesnakes evidently in parts of the Ozarks are spreading immensely and becoming quite a problem. Now, those of us that have farms and farming and all that know that snakes are a mixed blessing. You know, a big black snake will eat other poisonous snakes and they're one of the best things you can have around your place for varmints as far as rats, mice, voles. They will eat an egg or two. Rattlesnakes, same, maybe not quite as welcomed on, on Ellinghouse property because they have quite the bite. Uh, 
but we don't ever want to be overrun with them, and that's what's happening in great parts of our state now. And what scientists have linked this to is her lack of Razorback, the old Arkansas Razorback home. Modern, more babied, if you will, hogs will not engage a rattlesnake, even in self-defense. They, they will let it strike its victims. Razorbacks, and this was a three-year study, as I said, fascinated me. Razorbacks hunt them up, and they're one of their favorite foods. In fact, when they were killing some Razorbacks and dissecting to see what they'd been eating, because they've been accused of eating men, children, animals, and they are vicious animals in their own right. But frequently, when they killed a well-fed, in the summer, Razorback hog, the predominant undigested victim, were rattlesnakes. So this study in its second year went out to say, how are they, not, how are they avoiding the bite? And photography at this point wasn't able to capture this, but eyewitness accounts and them documenting this in their notebooks, they didn't even try. They just waded in. If they, if they, and they, they thought they could smell them, which given the, the olfactory abilities of a hog is not a stretch of imagination at all, that they sought out rattlesnakes. And then when they found one, they just went around stomping and eating it. And that the snake, they was observed attacking them, and it said one person's account was that it had no more effect on the hog as if the snake was biting an oak tree. And somehow they just weren't, whether it's the hide, they're not sure, but anyhow. So by killing out razorback hogs, we've created a problem now with rattlesnakes and let's build those. So what they're just recommending is if you have some land, you need to leave a few razorback hogs. I'd kind of, you know, I'd kind of, kind of like that talking about, you know, the timber wolves and liking to hear them howl. I'd kind of hate to envision a, a world where I didn't occasionally on horseback run, but see the signs and, and see occasionally a razorback hog. Preferably from a distance, I do have a strong sense of self-preservation for the paper's sake, for the paper's sake. October, as you know, they're having a constitutional convention in uh, 1922, and one of the most talked about amendments, it's actually listed as the second option it's being called, and it will strictly just strike the word male from the requirements to vote for Missouri. Everything else will remain the same, age, citizenship, and all that. But the statute, if this passes and the Constitution is amended, will no longer have the word male. Now, nobody's coming right out and saying we're giving women the vote. <laughs> Old habits die hard. We're just striking the male and we'll let the women take care of themselves. If they, you know, once they don't have to be a male, if they choose to vote, well, it will be their constitutional right if it prevails. We have an ad for furs, furs of all kinds wanted by Frank Barrow from the Greenville, Missouri. Publish, help publish his papers, my brother. But first of all, kinds, especially <coughs> special prices for number one red fox and number one mink. And it's not in the ad, but liking to have that whole picture. And when people see me out, they say, hey, what about this? I try to have the whole story. And so right now, prices are running between $13 and $15 for a number one red fox hide. And they're running $8 to $10 for a number one mink. So... And I don't think, I don't think Razorback hogs have a problem with them. So they ought to be out there to be able to trap or hunt them. November, we have a little more sad news. A well-known farmer was slain by a tenant. And we see too much of that. And uh, I like to think that in 1922, I was living in a world where my handshake was better than any contract or way for drugs. I'd like to think that, that uh, I look for the best in people, but in our paper and numerous other papers in the last couple of years, I've seen too much of that where somebody has hired somebody came down the road, sometimes with family, and entrusted them with helping them run a farm, put them up in either you know a, a line shack or something, only to find themselves being murdered in the middle of the night. Or happened again. Uh, 
this time of year, it's only good that we should think of the less fortunate. And uh, we have two stories in the November 9th issue about the homes wanted for orphan children. That's straight out of the orphanage saint in the Jefferson City or Capitol. And then a local Christian home orphanage of uh, Colonel Bluff, Iowa, is reaching out all the way down here and uh, asking if we have places to place young people. Tying that back to the other story, maybe a little patience, get a young man and train him to be that farm worker rather than taking somebody in off the road. Foul play, again, is suspecting the death of a man in Leaper. And I've had police officers tell me the best weapon they have for law enforcement is the stupidity of the average criminal. Uh, this person was found minus $230, according to friends. But it was made to look like he drunk himself to death, and he had a, a bottle of uh, not that good of homemade hooch in one hand and the lid of the hand the lid of the bottle was sitting on the other closed fist and the sheriff immediately thought how did that get there if he you know. so they're looking for somebody as of this they had not found them a year almost gone December Engineers are working on the north-south road, the 16 miles between Silva and Greenville. Much needed, much wanted. And then in the next few weeks, you'll see several articles about cotton growing in Wayne County. As you know, the, the largest challenge to cotton raising in years, even prior before the labor disruption and, and and rightful redistribution of you know paying people as opposed to owning people. But the largest problem they've had for years is the boll weevil. It actually started in Mexico, moved into southern Texas. As it moves up north, it's actually making it more profitable to look at cotton. And already we have boot hill farmers in just a few seasons have paid off mortgages, made improvements, increased their lifestyle. And so now it's being explored in Wayne County. Will cotton grow in Wayne County? And right now, experts that are looking at our land and all saying there's no reason that it will not. And so that would be another wonderful thing. But for those not wanting of the agrarian type that way, we have in uh, Greenville, just eight miles east, we have a complete sawmill outfit in good shape located on West Loist Creek. And you can buy the whole outfit. So concludes 1922, so concludes Charles's presentation. I hope I did the Elaine House family proud because I've been privileged to call her and his wife friends for many years. Wonderful, civic-minded people. Any questions I can take quickly as Charles, because I know I'm about out of time, Charles or Rick Mansfield. Yes, back in the back. The teacher examinations, if you pass that, do you authorize to teach a grade or in Missouri for a while, and I'm not as well up on this, Rick Mansfield, as probably Charles was, in the later 18, in the later 1800s, 1922, I'm not sure of, in the later 1800s, if you passed that exam in the state of Missouri, your results were sent in, you got a certificate, you could teach in any of these local small schools. Keep in mind, the vast majority of them quit at the end of the eighth grade. Now, if any of you ever seen, and I used to, again, Rick Mansfield, if I answer a question, it's, Charles, I'll put my hat on. But as Rick Mansfield, I used to have a collection of a lot of these eighth grade exams. And I gotta tell you, the one that, that I had for the Wyoming Territory in 1980, I don't know that I could ever pass it. I mean, it was, and I've got four college degrees, and I can remind people that, and 50 cents give me watered down coffee at most truck stops, but still four college degrees. I mean, you know, two different colleges thought I had, or three different, I guess, thought I knew something. And I don't know that I could have passed that eighth grade. So the eighth grade, you know, this is sad, and I'm being a little editorial, forgive me, but so was one of the things I enjoyed about reading that, and Harold and I were talking earlier, <laughs> without offending anybody, but when, and, and it was called the wet boat, and we talked some about the wet, you know, the <laughs> Bush was upset, he wanted drinking, but he was upset that we got drinking, but it's just, it's German and English ale. Uh, but the, uh, when they came in, when the Democrats came to power, the way the Greenville Sun reported it was, now that the radicals are in charge. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'll be a little, I'll be a little Charles, just, I would venture to say that, and I, I'm a retired superintendent, I've hired a lot of teachers. I would venture to say if that exam that they were passing was anything like that Wyoming exam, that out of the hundreds of teachers I've hired in my life, 10% at best would have passed it. So yeah, it did allow them to go teach, but I mean, it, the Wyoming the test had Latin, it had uh, physics, <coughs> certainly algebra, had intense grammar. Uh, I mean, those are tough tests. And, and, and them encouraging people to get there early so they go to that party. What I've read about it, and Missouri no exception at least, and I'm more familiar with the 1800s, the late 1800s, 1880s, 1890s. That was a, if you were pretty swift, you were there eight hours and you were running, you were running through pencils. You were there eight hours. Because one of the ads I remember reading in a, uh, I think it's a Green County paper reminding people to bring their pen knife to keep their pencil sharp. So, yeah. Any other questions at all? I've got a few books. I didn't bring them inside. If anybody just really wants them, I bought two tonight of Cleese. It's a wonderful writer, wonderful period, but I've got some of mine in the trunk of my car. If anybody's interested, I'll go get them. Any other, if there's no other questions, I will let you get on with whatever else you'd like to do tonight. First, by thanking you right there, you are correct, Sue? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, and, and were you the one, because this happened a lot to me lately, but were you one of the ones that called and said, you know, we've had a cancellation. Yes, that was me. We're out of time, so I thought of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not the only one. There's been like three this year. And so it's kind of like a young girl, like, you know, Brenda, it's, I know it's 5 o'clock Saturday night, honey, but nobody else answered the phone, so would you go out with me? <laughs> So rather than sit back in the corner and not get the dance, I said, sure. So. <laughs> but no, it has been a great privilege. I, I do thank you for the honorarium. I'm not used to that. Uh, and so any anytime else I tell people this, I've got cards tonight. Hopefully you all got a handout. That just had some interesting things that came straight out of the paper. I didn't want to read you the funnies, but I just found their sense of humor 100 years ago was just kind of neat. You know, it just, uh, and... Uh, I don't know why in that fur thing they didn't have the prices. I had to look that up and find that actually. Uh, but it was pretty good compared to, because when I coon hunted, and that would have been in the 60s, 40 some years later, and we, I don't think we got prices any better than that. No. Coon Heights jumped up one year thanks to Fess Parker. When he played Daniel Boone, the next year coon price went up. Well, I thank you very much. Anybody wants a book, tell me later. I've got them in the car. Again, thank you, it's been an honor privilege and it just warms my heart to see meetings started with the Pledge of Allegiance and a prayer. I volunteer a lot for the park service and if you ever wonder and I wish there were more young people to hear this but if you wonder if one person can make a difference I do a fair amount of things in the park service and usually free sometimes they have money but I think when they have money they can call somebody else but I always, I always start things with a prayer and if somebody else doesn't have it I have a prayer. And, and 15 years ago, that was like, Eric, you know, you're really not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that's you get me, you get a prayer. Mm -hmm. For the last four or five years, people even like Nina Madison, who's the chief interpreter, will introduce me. And she said, here's her speaker for the evening, and he's going to start you off with a prayer. Mm -hmm. And I even had an adopted niece a couple of years ago when I was uh, going around with her helping me present. And she looked up in a week. She said, you realize we've been at three places this week that traditionally didn't have prayer, and when you asked about having a prayer, and they said, well, yeah, if you do it, and just one person asking. Yeah. So I'll end this, so nobody leaves here thinking I, I would politicize a pulpit. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Bill Clinton years ago, in talking about the state of America, and he said, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with more of what's right with America. I'm not sure how he exactly meant that, but I love the quote, and I interpreted it this way. We have the same Bible. We have the same Constitution, which is a living document that can be amended. And so, yeah, we just, you know, one person at a time, meetings like this. Thank you very much. I'll come get my stuff later. I want to yeah. Thank you, sir. Excuse me. Yeah, he, we appreciate that, and I will say, I read a lot of living Bible sons. I, I subscribe to newspapers.com and uh, if you can at all afford that it's a monthly subscription <coughs> and uh, I'd, I'd recommend you do that because there is some interesting things 
I think right now from 1896 to 1945 is online. So a lot of history there you can read. And I wrote some materials for the paper using those resources as well. Um, any board member have anything they need to bring up? If not, I'll ask everyone to stand. We have refreshments. And if you want to stand, and we'll uh, dismiss. And I must be any club if you'll ask a blessing on the refreshments. Dearly, Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. And pray that you'll bless, uh, bless us food, Lord, and find a fellowship here and to have everybody to go home. Thank you, Mr. Mansfield. Give him a good, safe trip back over to the Rooms County, Lord. Just pray that you'll bless the efforts of this organization. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You bitch.